But most people that have say is this house believes that the present condition of humanity is better than it would be in 100 years. Have that practice, I would like to call upon the Prime Minister. Please deliver the speech within seven minutes. Hey, here. We want to consider whether the water use, uh, the after in the water uh, condition in 100 years is better or worse than the status quo. Um, we see that global warming is the biggest metric about it. And global warming, with, uh, as we talked talk later, is become worse in 100 years. Here, one, in 100 years, that is why we propose this mission. So, firstly, what is the better war in policy? People have better lives in this situation, who have better codes of lives. And they have sufficient, sufficient necessity, they have sufficient, sufficient food, and they have sustainable rights. And, the, all, and all of the world, uh, people all around the world who can, run, uh, can have the um, affordability. So, next, um, I, I said that global warming is the biggest metric, but uh, because, uh, why, why is why? Because global warming has a big impact over the world and affects the lives of every single person uh, in all the world, regardless of the general quality of resistance and sovereignty. So, and, oops, uh, no, sorry, here. Um, so I will explain uh, why, um, uh, why critical damage by global warming is likely to happen in 100 years, years. But secondly, I will explain why it is uh, impactful to uh, humanity. So firstly, explaining the critical damage by global warming is likely to happen. Why this case? Because there's polarization in this country, in this world, in the arts. And after, um, once polarization happens, this, is, uh, this can, um, global, uh, global warming cannot be achieved by the and through the world. Because global warming is what all nations have to co cooperate, and because it is a very big problem, right? So why polarization will occur? I have a bunch of reasons. Firstly, and the SNS. So in the, on the SNS, you you can have the uh, you can have the radical, like the more extreme information. And why extreme why extreme information exists in the SNS? Because the creators of the SNS information uh, want to attract the viewers and want to want to gain more views from and they want to popular in the SNS. But secondly, there's a polarization between developing countries and developed countries. Of course, some like affordable developed countries want to like prioritize the environment and they want to change change. But most of the, uh, the world and developing countries want to prioritize economic rights. Um, they don't care about the, the, the the condition in 100 years ago. They want to like solve the problem in the status quo. They want to in, they want to like uh, they, they want they want to live their lives of tomorrow. So they have to prioritize the economy. And there's um, such kind of polarization happen. But thirdly, with this also the conflict the conflict or like the and, uh, conflict between China and the US. And China, no thank you. China has the dominant in the countries. China has the same to America or the Asia and so on. And, and those, um, because China has prioritized the more expansion and economy and the encouraging them to expand the market, and the, that uh, those more people in, in under the China has um, the perception about the prioritized economy and not care about economy. But um, firstly, the United Nations is also unstable about the economy because um, the United Nations have the democratic system in politics and the, uh, once the president uh, once the president have the removed um, being removed from the um, the policies and the, the, the next politicians not the, the next politicians will occur and that they are uh, not necessarily have the same stance about environment but uh, as you see like Donald Trump don't prioritize the economy and he prioritizes nationality and the economy on in the United States. But 
But fifthly, the population increases occur in the status quo. Why population increase is very uh, connect, connecting to the, uh, the global warming? It's because firstly, global uh, population and if you um, the more more population increase um, means that more like you have to use the electricity, you you have to like fossil fuels and so on. And but it is uh, but secondly, the population increase is irreversible because you cannot like sacrifice a lot of people, the, the billions of people on Earth, right? They have to like live to what they will live the one hundred years and so on. So the population increase will occur and population increase and um, contributes to global warming. So as you see, um, what polarization, uh, I, I had explained what polarization happened, and, and for, as, as a reality, for example, not in you, as a reality, for example, um, you all you know that Paris, Paris Accord, right? Paris Accord set the, uh, the goals for global warming and what we have to, like, how many we have to cut down CO2 levels, and, but as you see in the reality, Goals are not achieved at all, right? And also, United Nations has the has left the has left the Paris Accord, and it also like yeah. So that is why uh, we say that they cannot cooperate at all about global warming and environment. And also, Kyoto Kyoto is not uh, achieved their goals at all. So that's why we say critical damage by global warming is likely to happen, in, and that will be more radical and more like more likely to happen in the 100 years. But secondly, I will explain why it is impactful to humanity. So every single person continuously uh, be affected by the environment movement. And that is very ir 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 irreversible effect you might, in, might there is the in, in, in 100 years, um, you might like, see the high, high UC levels and the food shortage and this world this 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 so deforestation and why is that? Because firstly, a lot of metropolitan cities are along the sea, right? So if the house sea level occurs, the a lot of cities will be uh, like in in the water in the sea, and you you see that that that's detrimental impact in humanity, right? But third, uh, but more very good shortage, uh, you have to like. You have to take over the other spiritual days and, like, and there's no bees, no insects, and no like, grains, and no animals, and so on. So that's why um, this um, very detrimental impacts on because of the global warming, and but that is why humanity will be devastated in Mahari. Thank you. 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 I would like to welcome the leader of opposition. Please deliver the speech within seven minutes. Here, here. we didn't have HPDU, this competition. And given that all of you judges like debating, I think it's only intuitive that we win from the start. I'm going to forward two arguments in this speech. Firstly, how we increase human rights. Secondly, on developing nations and how we get equality for them. Before that, frame and rebuttals. Firstly, then, on frame, we think the condition of humanity is likely to look like humans finding more value or finding more happiness. On to rebuttals, then. Their main argument here is that climate change is likely to be bad in 100 years. I have four major rebuttals to this. Firstly, we think this is not likely to happen because corporations want to make new technology in order to get a competitive edge, in order to get profit. Therefore, it's likely that given the current global trend, it's likely that they invest in things like green technology, which means that we're able to mitigate their harm or even make the climate better. But secondly, they say polarization will happen, but I think this is just unlikely. This is because given their own characterization that global point is that big of a deal, People will probably work together because it's a proximate issue to everyone. Therefore, it's likely that they actively do things in order to combat populations, increase bad impacts, which means we can also rebut to that mechanization as well. But three, I will prove in my first argument 
why social movements get better on our side, therefore climate change is not likely to be that big of a deal on the, our side. But fourthly, even if it happens and glad, quote, global warming is terrible, humans will still be happy. Humans will still have the capacity to be happy because we think they're just going to build things like defensive architecture and they're going to find happiness in other preferences that are aside from the environment around them. On to the first argument then, on increased human rights. The thesis of this argument is simple. Human rights are much more likely to be ensured on our side and we can get baseline equality for everyone in about 100 years. The premise of this argument is that the current context of the status quo is leaning towards liberalism, it's leaning towards human rights, and that will continue in 100 years. Why is this the case? Firstly, we think it's because currently there's widespread democratization going on within nations. This is because now that, that more people have basic rights, like democratic rights, they're now able to vote for themselves. Therefore, it's likely that if you are a minority and you're being oppressed, that's a proximate issue to you. Therefore, we think you're going actively going to vote for things like policies that protect you. But secondly, second part of the premise is that we think that people themselves are more accepting because of current global trends of things like globalization. This is because you need people on our side. Now people, are, because of globalization, they're able to see themselves that people from different races, people from different nations are much more equal to them and they deserve basic human rights. Given that premise, why do you think that this trend will continue in 100 years? Firstly, we think you simply just have more time to get social movements to have people opt in. This means that social movements are now able to explore different tactics, or they're able to explore the most effective tactic. We think this is likely to be manifesting in a good way because of things like widespread implementation of social media, which means that the value of entry towards the social movements is likely to be lower in 100 years. But the second part of the mechanization then is that we buy them simply more time to, in order to get things like structural change. We think on both sides, legislation is complicated. It requires time to pass through parliament. It requires things like changing politicians' minds. This means you need a significant amount of time in order for you to do things like protesting, in order for you to do protesting to actually get your message across. Therefore, in 100 years, we're actually able to have more time in order to do things like boycotts, and we think we can claim that the boycotts will be effective because obviously social justice movements have an incentive to make change effective, therefore I think they're going to explore the effect, most effective way. What do you think the main impact of this is? We think the main impact of this argument is that we're able to ensure baseline human rights on the R side. What is the way under this? A, we think this is practically good if people, one, now have basic rights, but two, because they have basic rights, they're able to explore their other preferences because they have things like financial freedom, they're able to buy things like other preferences. But secondly, weighing on principle, we think everybody should have basic rights given that right now in the status quo, it's unfair that you aren't given social rights just based on your birth, which is arbitrary. You do not get to choose where you are born in, you do not get to choose what race you are born as. Therefore, we think it's better that we prioritize everyone's preferences equally and we at least get that on our side. On to the second argument then, on the conditions and how we get equality for them. The thesis of this argument is that we lessen disparity among nations and it will be more balanced on a global scale. The premise on our side is that a premise on premise for this argument is that disparity exists on their side. Why do you think this is the case? Firstly, we think that a lot of um, for example, African nations within the status quo were colonized, which means that because of time, they do not have an advantage over other countries like America or the UK. But secondly, we think countries are disadvantaged because of geographical location. They often need to make up for geographical location. They often need things like time in order to get industrial revolution. Why then do we think this is likely to manifest in a bad way on their side? Firstly, we think that some nations are simply not able to reach their maximum potential because they stop at the time in the status quo where they're in, in like the middle of industrializing or in the middle of turning into a first class economy. But secondly, we think that there's a low quality of life depending on your birthplace on their side of the house, which we think is a fundamental injustice that must be fixed. How do we fix this? With more time, we get more investment. This manifests in four main ways. Firstly, we think bigger nations have an incentive to invest in these because they want to increase their global GDP because they can also be wealthier by, having, by investing in these countries which they have connections with. But secondly, we think countries themselves want to be rich, right? Like no country wants to be poor. Therefore, we think that they put emphasis on things like building factories, they put emphasis on things like industrial revolution. But C, there's a corporation competition. We think that a lot of corporations want things like labor, they want things like having a first mover advantage towards these new, newly industrializing economies. Therefore, we think they are likely to invest in these places. But even if, and this is the fourth way this manifests, even if there is no corporation or no like, government nation incentive to invest, 
we think China will invest, and we think that is a good thing. This is because China has an expansionist policy. They want to get more land in order to showcase their power, in order to get more allies. The example of this is things like the BRI. So on that financial level alone, we're able to ensure um, able to ensure investment. What is the impact here? Three things. Firstly, we get a financially higher quality of life for developing nations. Again, we think it's just simply more important because you're now able to have feel financially secure, which means that you're more likely to speak up for things like social justice. The second thing, we equalize the global inequality within countries. This is really important because now developing countries have more say in global institutions, which means they can now actively speak up against things like climate change and how they're being disproportionately affected, which greatly clashes with their side. But thirdly, on principle, we think it's arbitrary that you're determined on birth. We think 100 years means 100 miles from us. And for us, very proud to propose. I would like to welcome the member of government. Please deliver the speech within seven minutes. Here, here. Lastly, the Diet of Israel passed a law making it harder to overthrow the sitting Prime Minister. This Friday, they're trying to overthrow the judiciary system by, by allowing the government to change the Supreme Court justices or overthrow all of their decisions. We can't tell for sure how politics or human rights or any of those values that side opposition is trying to protect are actually going to pay, uh, play out because we've, we've seen examples throughout, this, throughout the world, throughout even like this year, last year, and two years ago, how we really can't tell. And what we can tell, though, is how the climate is going to change and how it's actually going to be a detrimental world in 100 years. And that is why we are very happy to vote. Now, before I go on to reconstructions, I just want to make out a lot of points to what side opposition, side opposition talked about. First of all, they talked about how corporations would invest in climate change. This, yes, they might. In what, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years? Right now, as of right now, as we talked about in polarization, because the world is so polarized, say the United States is polarized between Democrats and Republicans, this, because of this polarization, corporations don't have this incentive, no, incentive to actually give in as much money as the side of opposition might want to say. Yes, they might give some money in hopes for like preserving the name value, but we can't say for sure, and there's no guarantee that the money is actually going to be substantial enough to actually combat climate change. It's more likely that they're just giving money to say they're giving money to climate change and they don't actually care for climate. Second thing they talked about was that even if global warming was like, even if we concede global warming, they would rather have avoid the what, human rights and whatnot. Well, obviously this is false because I would rather prefer not having human rights but having food, food that can only be had, only can be produced if we can save ourselves from global warming. And we believe that since global warming can't be changed, yeah, I need food. Side opposition can't provide any food. So. Next thing, last thing, the last thing, I just want to point out an analogy. Human rights. They talked about human rights and whatnot, about everything. Hey, you say the social movements are actually going to have time to experiment. And say the social movements are actually going to be succeeding in 100 years. When are they going to actually start succeeding? Yes, they might be succeeding then in 100 years. But what if they start succeeding in 50 years? We don't have 50 years to combat climate change. The United Nations gave out a report that was, we we're going to meet the limit of 1.5 degrees by 2035. That's 15 years earlier than what we expected. We really can't say for sure that in 100 years, just because we have this, we would have the technology, we're going to be able to 
to reverse every single thing that happened with climate change. Yeah. So, yeah. So, given that there's more awareness of people on the ground about things like social movements and green technology, because by the nature that these harms are more proximate to them, how can we assert that these social movements won't be affected in the long term? So first of all, I didn't say that social movements won't be affected in the long term. Well, well you didn't ex explain why they're actually going to be like, completely affected, and we gave you reason, two reasons. A, in the long term, it may succeed, but if it doesn't succeed in the short term, we have a time limit of 15 years, 20 years to actually combat climate change to the point where it's actually effective. We need it there. We don't need 100 years if we're going to fail in 20 years. That 80 years is something that's going to be non-existent because we actually need to combat the 1.5 degree change that we're not going to be able to do in the near future. Second, okay, so, yeah, I think that's about it for rebuttals. But finally, why equality? We believe we're not pushing equality. We believe that we're, the reason why we're saying that equality is less important than climate change, why this climate change is so important and why it's so detrimental is exactly because I said food. We need food. Food isn't something that can be produced without a proper world. And a proper world can only exist without global warming. So going on to a lot of things that I just want to point out. Okay. So the first thing I want to point out is a re reconstruction of what my prime minister talked about. My prime minister talked about how global warming is so impactful and why it's not changing. Why global warming is not changing at all. What are the reasons for this that he gave? Global warming isn't changing because, first of all, people aren't realizing yet how important it is. Yes, a substantial number of people are realizing, but at the same time, because of polarization that we can see in the United States, because countries like China or like Russia not caring, having, having no regard whatsoever for climate change, or maybe just giving billions of dollars to say that they're giving money, we really can't see any improvement what right now. We're, we can see that we're declining. We can see that we're declining, and that decline is going to take us somewhere before any improvement starts. And what are the actual like effects of this though? Because like even if climate change like continues, if it's only one degree increase in in the world, we really don't care. But the fact that the one degree increase exists is a problem. Why is this? It's because say sea level. When one meter, when sea level rises one meter, what happens? Well, a few countries sink. They're gone. A uh, few islands sink. They're gone. Your livelihoods are going to be. Some of you guys are probably going to be gone if you guys live somewhere in Tokyo. So what happens then? No. So what happens then? Yes, the climate change movement may actually like, start working after we sink, because that's when people actually recognize the fact that their livelihoods are being damaged. Because, as type of opposition pointed out, people might have defensive technology to actually, like, like, to actually block themselves from the effects of climate change. So what happens then? What happens is that the moment people actually recognize, the, more, the moment the majority of the people actually want to start working on climate change, it means that we're already too late, because the sea levels rise. And even if we manage to decrease temperature, which is probably not feasible given the technology, um, we're still not going to have those glaciers back. We're still not going to be able to recover half of sunken Tokyo. That's not possible. Now, moving on to just a point in why side opposition, side opposition will never succeed. Let's think about it like this. 30 years before, I think all of you have probably seen like Back to the Future. Back to the Future, where there's like super high tech thingy, and when does that take place? Probably in like 2020 or something right? like that, right? In 2020, do we have time traveling? No. Do we have any of those gadgets there? No. What do we see here? We can't, accept, we can't expect a feasible technological advancement in order to combat any of the problems that we see here. Even we focus on climate change right now, but we can, also, we can also focus on human rights. We can't, like, we can't see that feasible technological advancement that would actually be providing enough food for people given the fact that there's going to be climate change that is effect negatively affecting the production of food in the world right now, especially with the population still being expected to increase in the future. For other things that may impact the welfare of humanity, such as, like, I don't know, war. We really can't see about war either. We've seen Ukraine and Russia spontaneously just starting a war. Yes, there may have been backlash, like, there may have been history there, but still, it's a war that we really didn't expect to happen, but it happened. What we are saying right now is because there's so many unvariables, so many like so many variables that happen in the world, such as war, such as international relationships, but especially climate change, that we really can't expect a feasible change for. And even if there was a feasible change, because that feasible change will be so low, so late, we are very happy to propose. Thank you. I thank the member of government for the remarks. I would like to welcome the member of opposition. Please deliver the speech within seven minutes. Hey, here.
Side proposition in this debate is all bark and no bite because they never systematically prove to you where the impacts of things like global uh, pollution, like climate change, will affect the human condition. They lay out a whole bunch of like impacts about how you're going to have less food and stuff like that, but they never really analyze how it would affect the human condition. What we did to you was the opposite. We analyzed what happened to the human condition. I think that is why we win this debate. I like to talk about three things in my speech. Firstly, what is the likelihood of polarization on both sides of the house? Secondly, which side is better for the environment? And thirdly, on my uh, extension of why technological development is going to be good for our side of the house. With that being said, moving on to my first clash on which side, uh, what is the likelihood of polarization? The major thing that they said in their first claim, in their first claim was that polarization will happen. Notice that, first of all, they never really explained why you're going to have massive societal impacts because polarization will happen in the first place. Sure, they talked about deadlock, but why would deadlock, but like, they never really explained what the impacts of deadlock were. But even if we do ignore that little blunder, let's talk about, I'm going to give you three mechanistic reasons why their side falls. Firstly, they never proved why this is bad for people in uh, 100 years. Because even if you have, say, let's take our worst case and say like World War III on our side of opposition, countries can obviously rebuild. For example, let's talk about World War II. Although there was massive conflict, you still like, it, it, uh, like you, you still saw countries like China, you still saw countries like America rebuild after World War II, right? So obviously, that never really proved why it would affect people in 100 years specifically. That is why they lose this round. But secondly, massive uh, polarization and things like massive conflict is unlikely to happen for a couple of reasons. Number one, and the major reason, is deterrence theory. For example, like countries have massive amounts of nuclear weapons right now, which means that they're unlikely to have massive war uh, that they talk about, or like massive amounts of polarization on their side. This proves that not, there's not going to be massive societal harm for people in 100 years, which is better than the far side of the house. But thirdly, notice that, no thank you, that massive global impact like climate change will probably make people band together on our side of the house. For example, this looks like the coronavirus. This looks like how millions of people in Europe banded together to support Ukrainian victims of Russian invasion. Uh, this is for a couple of reasons. Notice that people are not going to be polarized in, say, the long term, in, say, 50 years. This is because Reno's analysis that we gave to the Prime Minister was about how massive collective positive attention towards global climate change will happen on our side because there's massive like social movements that advocate for things like, uh, you know, like, let's raise awareness to climate change that they actually never responded to, right? That is why their analysis falls at the end of this clash. But even if you do take your absolute best case, and this has been really charitable to side opposition, polarization will, uh, and, and say that polarization will happen, we actually flip this point, because the process of polarization that they explained is happening in the status quo is actually worse for the minority. This is because, number one, you have trade tariffs, sanctions that disproportionately harms people on the ground. But secondly, in extreme, you have proxy wars, things like the Vietnam War, things like the Ukrainian War that is going on right now, which harms people on the ground as well. So on their side of the house, you actually increase conflict, you actually increase the amount of suffering for people on the ground. What this looks like, it looks like people in Africa starving because there's no longer wheat imports coming in from Ukraine. It looks like Germany lacking oil because Russia stopped their supply. Why? Uh, this is debate money. But secondly, we got my second question: on which side is better for the environment? The major claim that we, uh, the major push that we get from the first speaker and second speaker is about global warming and how you're not going to have any food to eat. The first thing I want to point out is that, the, uh, is that like, the impacts for this are very extreme. So like, even if like, there's a one degree increase in, say, like, the, uh, in the temperature of the world, it's probably not going to lead to us like, drowning in like, a huge tidal wave or something like that, right? It's probably going to take place over a gradual period, even if we do take our absolute worst case. For example, say over the course of 50 years, right? Uh, with that, uh, that's why their first thing, impact, falls out of this debate. But even if we do take their, uh, you know, even if we do ignore that analysis, there are three reasons why this point is wrong. Number one, social movements may prove that in Reno's speech, social movements will increase. And presumably, social movements also include climate change activists like Greta Thunberg. This is debate winning because the reason why the environment is bad in the status quo is because in the 1800s and 1900s, when we had massive industrial revolutions which developed major nations, people didn't know about climate change. People didn't know that their activities were hurting the world, right? But now people do. That's the crucial characterization, sure. which means that you're going to have massive funding for green technology, as we can see, is happening in the status quo, with things like nuclear fusion getting massive investment from, say, governments. 
No, thank you. This above analysis is important because we pr uh, prove that the, for the environment, the status quo is the ultimate low point. On our side, you're going to have environments that are good for everyone involved. But secondly, they never prove why a decrease in climate change will decrease the human condition, right? So presumably, if the climate change is such a big deal, it's going to drown everyone, it's going to cause food shortages for vast amounts of people in the status quo, then probably there's probably going to be technological innovation that is going to deal with it, right? For example, Norway's water dams to decrease tidal flooding is already taking place in St. Norway, right? All these types of innovations mitigate all their arguments on their side of the house. This is also debate winning because all of propositions analysis, like how animals no longer have an environment, is falls out of this fight. Before we move on, yes. Do you, uh, you sincerely believe that like the first time global warming is actually like, talked about was in like 1960. It's been 60 years, and the first thing that we've seen, like a proper movement, was probably in like 2010. Do you sincerely believe that in 100 years we'd actually be able to solve this problem? Yes, because you have massive social change in the status quo as you improve the climate. So you have to engage that analysis before you can say come up here with, uh, with examples. So moving on to my extension on why technology is improving the condition of humanity. I have three mechanisms to support this analysis. Firstly, we have things like AI, like chatbot, 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 which is effective at maximizing your time and your ability to have free time in the first place and gather information. But secondly, other technology will probably increase human agency. For example, virtual reality tools, which allows you to play golf at your home, for example. But thirdly, even if, say, the world is bad, say, like, nuclear war happens, say, the environment becomes horrible, as they explained, innovation allows you, uh, allows humans to live where you want to, or say, like, or live in domes where, like, climate change doesn't affect you as much. And this is debate winning, because as you can clearly say in the motion, it literally says the human condition. That is why technology will likely improve increasing our agency and increasing our ability to live. Lastly, I just want to note something that was very important that came in Prime Minister that side proposition decided not to engage to. The very minority in this debate, the minority that are getting get agency from massive amounts of social funding, from massive amounts of social movements, that are going to increase on their side of the house. This is debate winning because these minorities were pressed in the status quo. These minorities lived under colonial times. What we do is give them agency, and that is why we win. I thank a member of the opposition for the remark. I would like to welcome the government with please deliver the speech within seven minutes. Here, here. Today, we should be happy for being able to have this HPDU and not being constrained by issues like being, um, like issues like being worried about 
whether or not we can, good food will be put on the table tomorrow. We, we, on our side, we predict the reality under the status quo, but where we don't have to worry about everyday issues, and instead we can worry about the human rights. We say that on our side of the house, we will actually be able to live, people will actually be able to live, while on their side of the house, they won't be able to. First, rebuttals. First, they explain how liber their whole, their, first of all, their argument was about how people are able to continue the way they live, this, based on the fact that people are going to be able to live, continue to live um, their same lives. We explain clearly how they're unlikely to be able to do so, first of, first of all, because of all of the environmental issues. I'll further explain this later, but, and uh, they didn't clearly engage to our mechanism about, like, the, about, like, uh, insects going extinct and how insects going extinct and how that will impact the whole industry as well, and there will have to be a change there. Second, they, their, their first argument, the premise of their first argument was about how liber, liberalism is a trend among the current in the society under the status quo. However, we, we, this is definitely not true. First of all, because like we explained, the polarization and the politicalization of environmental issues are precedent under the status quo. They, like in the, the, in the, in the like in their in their whole speech, they explain how democracy is the, democracy is spreading all around the world. We acknowledge this. This we say that uh, since democracy is is spreading all around the world, the politicalization is spreading as well. Environmental issues, like for example, in the United States, the Dem Democratic Party promotes the, the environmental issues, while well, the Republican Party is anti is anti environment anti-environmentalists. We say the same thing is going to occur in more of the areas where under the status quo there's a consensus that environmental issues should be protected. We say that this is un and it's unlikely that there's going to be a consensus among the world that there's that we as a human as the human the humankind should actually tackle these issues. They explain though how how the social SNS makes it easier for these people to opt in. And we, but at the, it might make it easier to opt in, but it, at the same time, what it does is it creates a vacuum and echo chamber. Polarization and politicalization is going to be more present. This is why I mean, since Twitter was after Twitter or those social social media was involved, as, since then the politicalization and polarization all over all over the world has excelled. And moving on. Oh, Third, they explain how the recognition is going, definitely going to spread then in these time. We say that most people already recognize that the environmental issue that exists, and the reason why these people aren't, aren't opting into these movements is because, they, first of all, they, they, believe, they don't believe in these in these things because of, like, because of the politicalization of this, and they explain, oh, how it's proximate, so, and if they're going to have them, if they're going to suffer in the future, then they're going to obviously fix, they're going to obviously opt in. We say that it's not proximate because in the future, or the, the impact of the act of, in the status quo is going to ref be reflected in the future, so these people aren't going to necessarily care about what happens in the future. And they explain how they, these organizations can use different methods. We say that they already are using these different methods under the status quo, and we, we don't, they have to make that what kind of how these how actually these movements are going to utilize these methods. Third, next they explain even their best case is basically these people who are who are getting discriminated and who don't have the rights in like developing countries are going to get rights. We we think this is a very good thing. However, at the same time we have to ensure it's. A, but on our side of the house, what we prove is that uh, climate change is, we prove is the fact that climate change is going to have a continuous impact toward these people especially. We, we explain, basically, what happens is, the thing, they, they explain how all of these, like Finland and other nations can evolve technology. We believe that this technology is, unli is unlikely to evolve and shouldn't be part of this debate because it's, uh, it's not certain. But, 
even if we say it exists, it's unlikely to be applied on developing nations because these nations don't have the same financial capacity as the developed nations. So we don't quite, yeah. we think these people are going to it's actually, or I'll think of you on. We gave you like a bunch of mechanisms and prime minister of like both the nations within the same level of agency as both nations on our side of the house. Okay, so, yeah, I'll, I'll respond to the, the next speaker was that. Okay, finally. So, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. so basically, on our side of the house, climate change is definitely going to happen because we clearly explained how, first of all, it's much harder to stop. It, it, because first of all, it's much harder to stop a movement rather than actually create like a technological movement or actually push a new movement about like these climate issues. And this, in fact, explained how. Well, it's not, this impact is going like war. They're going to be able to uh, return, they're going to be able to rehabilitate from whatever detrimental impact it might have. We say it's a continuous impact because the environment has, because the, if the environment is critically damaged, it's going to impact the people of the future generation. And it itself is hard to reverse because it's hard to basically lower the, Lower the sea level, or even if the sea level is lowered, like the, the the salt is still going to be in the soil, so it'll be harder to grow crops. We say that it's much harder to reverse this kind of trend while under the status quo. Or the, even though all these people in developed country, developing countries don't have one all the rights we have in developed countries, they still are able to put food on the table and they're still able to live the minimum life. And we say that this is the thing that we must protect on our side of the house and that's why we win today's debate. I thank the government whip for the remark. Now I'd like to welcome the opposition whip. Please deliver the speech within seven minutes. Here, here. Uh, my name is Ruan Arakami. I'll be giving with. <clears throat> Throughout the entirety of side proposition, we never get an actual engagement to all of our arguments. The only arguments that they seem to push and the only thing that they seem to be doing throughout all of their speeches is reconstructing on and on about the environment. Therefore, in the first part of my speech, I'm going to prove to you that this is not important in the round. And the simple reason for this is that the harms of these environmental damage is mitigated to a significant degree with the increasing technological capacity. Human condition, as defined in this debate, is ability to access happiness. We define to you this from Reno's speech. They do not contest this at all. Given this, it's not very likely that, you know, like, you have a less fulfilling life or a less happy life because global warming is happening. Like, think about it. Do you guys feel more happy or, like, less happy than your parents, like, who lived, like, 30 years ago? I don't think so. This is because the capacity for human to access happiness derives from other things that are outside of your minimal interests. This is things like, for example, your hobbies. This is things like, for example, your passions. We told you from Oji's speech, never gotten the engagement to from their side of the house, that our side actually increases the capacity for individuals to pursue those passions that they really love, right? We increase the capacity because with more efficient technology, like for example, ChatGPT, we get information about our hobbies increasingly more quicker. Like we can learn other languages quicker and we can access other cultures quicker and such. Therefore, we think that for this debate, which is about human condition, we think our point was much more important than their wasted analysis about the environment. Therefore, we took the debate on majority. With that, I'm going to explain two things. First, about why outside of the majority of people and their ability to like, access happiness through hobbies, we won the debate on the minorities. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about the environment. Firstly then, on minorities. 
So we have two arguments on this. First of all, that you access more democratic rights on our side of the house for more nations that are oppressing the status quo. Secondly, we told you that the entrenched birth lottery is likely to be fixed on our side of the house. They literally give zero engagement to our, all of our analysis. So let me weigh this argument to be more important than their point on environment. Firstly, this is more important because of the degree of suffering that these people receive. These people in these oppressed countries, which are like millions of people in the status quo, are literally robbed of their right to speak up against the authorities. They're literally not educated. Some of the girls are raped in the status quo. This is far more likely to be more harmful than whatever the small impacts you get from having like one degree up in terms of global warming that's probably the capacity of the change that they achieved throughout 100 years. Therefore, it's very likely that in terms of degree of suffering, you should err on our side and the problems that we fix on our side. Secondly, in terms of principle, I'll take you later, we think that it's immoral that birth lottery plays a big part in deciding your life. Literally, your ability to live a dignified life is decided by birth lottery and the status quo. I might have been born in a country like Sudan, where I might not have been able to get like education, I might not have been able to speak, do debate like my passion in front of you guys at this moment. Therefore, we think that it's unfair that birth lottery decides a lot of what you do in the status quo. Therefore, at the point in which we give them more capacity to access things like GDP, which they never engage to, we think that we give more rights to more people. This also engages with their minor argument about the minorities not having capacity to fight back against environmental issues, because our point actually proves that minorities in the status quo that are more poor get more access to financial wealth on our side of the house, which equalizes their capacity to combat things like environmental crisis. Sure. Uh, so you say that like social movements are going to change, say, the birth lottery. But why do we see then, like, with so many social movements in this world right now, why do we see China being oppressive to the country? And that's not changing for the past few days, it's getting worse. Why do we see Israel trying to debunk its democracy from the beginning yesterday? Why? Okay, so our arguments were not only about social movements. We think that social movements would gather more support on our side naturally with more increase in knowledge that we achieve from things like increased technology, first of all. But we think that our arguments were not just about you know, like things like social movements, all right? Our arguments about birth lottery was more so upon things like corporate incentives, things like Chinese BRI, equalizing the playing field for countries that are more minor in the status quo. With that, I move on to the point about environment, which is your main point. But as I proved to you, I think this is not important in the round, but I'm still gonna engage to it anyways and engage, take the high burden. Look, let's look at their analysis one by one. First of all, the main analysis coming from their side continuously is that because of the political incentive of countries, people are polarized and therefore un they're unable to cooperate towards fixing these issues. To engagement. First of all, the premise for this analysis is basically given from their first speaker that SNS is a radical place. Like, countries don't communicate using SNS, right? So presumably, I don't think their premise stands and therefore their mechanism doesn't fly. Second, even if you buy their mechanism, if they're politically polar, like, even if they're politically polarized, it's very likely that there's this overwhelming incentive for these politically polarized countries to come together just for the sake of the environment. And this we see in countries like, for example, like America, China, and Russia. They're all coming together to discuss things like carbon tax and the status quo on a global scale, putting aside their different political incentives. Therefore, we think that those things can happen. And the mechanism for why you should judge, like what, why you should buy our characterization, is because of two folds. First, because nations get internal accountability. This engages to a third point on like democracy and stuff, third mechanism on democracy, like polarizing people. But a lot of people know that the environment is a problem and they feel like threatened by these things, right? Their third speaker basically concedes this analysis. Then the only remaining burden for would be the interest of the people, the politicization of social movements. People are likely to care more about environmental issues and that actually being solved in politicization of political movements because more proximate things are affected, right? Things like your capacity to access things like food, things like jobs, things like living costs. All of these things are likely to be more proximate to these people than things like if, you know, the social movement that you're supporting is democratic or not. Therefore, these things aren't likely to be true. Second, nations get external accountability. This is to see things like social movements, like just oil movements. And the thing here that I want to differentiate is that these things, like green GDP, that shows that country, that incentivizes countries to care about these things, are increasing in terms of opt-ins in the status quo. Therefore, we think that we actually solve this problem. Second, in terms of population, they say population, but it's going to decrease in the long term. Also, like green technology is going to increase, so development will happen in fields of green technology. And here's where I want to break their premise of their, all of their arguments, which is that they never explain why development will happen in a way that harms the environment. This is not likely because of two reasons. Three reasons. First, because green technology is increasing. Second, because development in, is transitioning to things like electric vehicles and stuff. Third, there's more in regulations and stuff. And all of these things are leading to net less carbon emissions, and therefore this reduces green technology. Uh, therefore, we think that we uh, took the debate. Uh, 
But why is the environment of the status quo actually worse? This is an analysis theorem from OJ that never gets an engagement to from their side as well. Because in these 100 years, development happened in a way where people did not care about the environment because people simply did not have the knowledge to do these things. People now care more about it because people kind of know more about these things. Therefore, green technology is increasing, and therefore net emission is decreasing in the status quo. And given the nature's mechanism of recovery, it's very likely that with net less emission, it's very likely that these harms are severely mitigated from their side of the house. Finally, they say immediate change is necessary, but this is simply an assertion. We think that uh, second, like even if immediate change is necessary, we already told you why green technology is likely to exist on our side of the house, why these things are increasing in terms of opt-ins, so therefore change is actually happening in the status quo, reality they never fail to contest with. Let's start the opposition brief for the remark. I would like to welcome the leader of our opposition to deliver the refined speech. Please deliver the speech within five minutes here. Thank you. Status quo, the PM, and continue to stick to attempting to reconstruct it, even though it's a losing game. It is our engagement that continuously evolves throughout all three speakers, and that is why we take this debate. I'm going to ask two questions with this speech. Firstly, how do we guarantee human rights? Secondly, on climate change. Firstly, on guaranteeing human rights, our lines of analysis were bust. One, we have more time to explore di different effective strategies for these social justice movements. Second, we buy more time and attention for activism, which increases things like opt-ins, like attention. But thirdly, we increase investment in developing nations. We gave you four days of independent analysis under this, which was never independently engaged with. Even if only one of these stats, we can still take this debate. Here's where I flip that polarization mechanization. Polarization is higher in the status quo because of current wars and lack of human rights movement opt-ins. We decreased this on our side because our impact from first in our second argument was that developing nations have more say in global institutions because they have more things like financial capital. Let's play on their end impact, which they give in second, which is like lack of food. And they really push this. They say things like people will be starving because there's lack of food. This is crucial weight because all throughout all three speakers, they never explain to what extent this lack of food would look like. Given this, and that people in the status quo are literally starving because of these structural reasons that we gave you, things like colonialism, things like geographical location, therefore, even if there is a net decrease in the amount of food, we distribute it more equally, which means we fulfill the baseline need of more people in the status quo. Why then is this debate winning? Firstly, we're able to guarantee the right to life, which is a prerequisite to all other rights. Secondly, we think it's unfair that people in right now are starving because of the arbitrary lottery above of where they were born in. We gave this wing in LO, they never bothered to engage. I want to third the extension that we gave from OG. We said there's going to be more technology, which means that we have more knowledge, we have more capacity to explore our preferences. This means we maximize happiness for more people on our side. Now, their counter to this is that developing nations are disproportionately affected by global warming. To engagement here, firstly, as we proved in um, First speaker, countries will have more A, financial capital to buy more things like green technology, but secondly, they have more same global institutions, which means that they're more able to get things like reparation and donations. But secondly, in DLO, we flipped this. We said environment is much worse on their side because up to the status quo and like development happened in a way which was unsustainable because people simply did not have knowledge or people did not feel that the environmental damage was proximate. Therefore, it's much more likely that development will happen more uh, sustainably on our side. Okay, let's talk about climate change because their one singular line of analysis are uh, polarization. Firstly, polarization will not happen because the harms are more proximate to you. As they say, if they say people are starving, obviously people don't want to starve. Therefore, I think they're going to group together and this decreases polarization. But secondly, if that rhetoric from second is, uh, you get to combat climate change in 50 years on our side, that's bad. Note the comparative. On their side, they have zero years. On our side, at least we have 50 years, 100 years to one, get more opt-in, but secondly, get more investment in these things and green technology, which is likely to happen because companies want a first mover advantage and a competitive edge over other companies. But I think they are very unstrategic because they never proved a tipping point in time where global warming triggers all of these impacts that they want to talk about. They shift from 20 years, they shift from 30 years, they shift from 50 years. We were much more clear on how this continued development will be done, will, um, will happen on our side, and that is why we take this debate. We at least proved that we mitigate these impacts because we have the time to collectivize. We were not analytical 
Um, and it's called quality. But we think that people have an incentive to combat this because it's a more proximate issue to this. This means, one, they'll fight against it. But secondly, even if climate change absolutely happens, there's no impact on human capacity to be happy. This is because, one, people don't feel happy because of the climate. But secondly, even if they do now, the norm shifts and people will find other ways in which to be happy. But thirdly, we think, as we told you from the first, we'll build things like defensive architecture. They say they want to put this by saying polarization what happened, but they never prove the likelihood because as we analyze, we can find more time in order to decrease things like that. If you're mad for our case, go mad. Thank the leader of the I would like to welcome the Prime Minister of my speech. Uh, please, the first speech, please, welcome to see you here. The premise that side opposition ignores is that these problems that we have in today's world are all in the process of worsening. They fail to acknowledge the fact that their optimistic outlook does not reflect the status quo. So before we go on to probably the biggest clash about environmental movements, I just want to point out a few things on human rights. Why do we say that human rights A is, should be ignored, and B, why this is, first of all, like not that as effective? Why do we need to ignore this? First of all, why do we say climate change is a much better thing to actually debate about this? Is because it affects many more people. Yes, human rights is a huge thing that affects many people around the world. But at the same time, climate, uh, climate change is probably going to affect more people, considering it's probably going to affect people in the European Union, people, affecting, uh, people affected in the United States, and other things that are probably not going to be affected when we talk about human rights. Well, let's go back to human rights, right? Because in human rights, they need to prove how the human rights are actually going to be preserved, how people are actually going to be getting that basic right that every person it needs to be guaranteed. They gave out a few things such as like corporate incentive, financial incentive from China and whatnot. But seriously, let's look at the status quo, let's look at like how this is actually going to play out. Because we believe it's not going to play out in a good way. Why? First of all, we really, in the status quo right now, we've seen Lula ousting the far right president in Brazil. And that became leftist. And yes, we preserve democracy there. We, produce, we preserve human rights there. At the same time, we've seen Hong Kong being taken into mainland China, and we've seen the rights of speaking out being taken out. And when they say that China is, say, they have an incentive to help these countries, we have no guarantee whatsoever that the uh, rights are actually going to be preserved. They have to prove that the rights of the countries that are being helped are going to be proved and at exact, uh, are going to be Safe and at the exact same time are also going to be improved. That is something that they fail to do. But well, moving on to environment, because that's probably the biggest debate. Environment. The biggest like, blunder outside the opposition was saying that, well, we'll have technological advancements. Advancements. A. Assuming that we actually do have these technological advances, such as like defensive mechanism and whatnot, how are we going to distribute that to the entire world? We're probably not going to be able to do that. They said that, like, hey, uh, Rising sea levels, we can probably just make a defensive mechanism around that. How? Like, you don't have the financial like, ability to do that to every single person. You're probably going to be doing that to, say, the developed countries, not the developing countries that you would care less about when you're in a state of dire need. So obviously, when we're talking about like happiness, we need to talk about happiness of everybody, not happiness in the people in developed countries. We believe that we're not going to be able to reach all these people, and because we're going to be leaving these crucial people, people who don't have access to technology, because there's a cap on how much money we can use, how, much, how many people we can access, how much resources we have, we believe there's going to be a cap, and we believe that we're going to be leaving a lot of people behind, especially in those developed countries, uh, developing countries. So why do we win? Why do we say that environmental movement is so 
slow, why it's not effective, why the environment is going to fail us all. So the reason for this is like, considerably simple. We need to acknowledge the fact that right now we're heading towards the doom. We need to change that, and the movement is trying to decrease the amount of energy it's using the world is like heading towards the doom. And even if we manage to hit the point where we emit the exact same amount of CO2 as the exact same amount of like, like consuming CO2 as much as emitting CO2, we're still not going to change anything. Because at that point, it's a stalemate, and that deadlock is probably going to be too late in order to actually change the world, in order to actually reverse all the bad effects that we've had on the world. Even if we were able to manage some cool things, even if we were able to manage to, like, I don't know, save the world, decrease the sea level, that's probably still not going to happen, because we've seen islands sinking at our point. 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, it doesn't make that much of a difference because we know there's a deadline and that deadline is not 100 years and we need to act before that deadline something that is not possible. But lastly, food. Food is the biggest problem, biggest root of our happiness. They're talking about happiness and entertainment. We're saying we're not going to have enough food because we're going to be losing land because of the heat, because of deforestation and that is the main reason why food, the root of happiness, is going to be decreasing and that is why we're very happy to propose. Thank you. Thank you for your cooperation. Big claps to both teams.